Good morning, I'm Ryan from Old School Automotive and we're doing our first video here of 2022. Hopefully this year we'll be able to have a lot more uh, content for you guys. And uh, if you like what you see, like and subscribe and hopefully we can get a lot more content out to you. Uh, today we're out here, I'm gonna show you the newest project for Old School Automotive. It's this uh, right back here, 1971. Winnebago D27. We'll give you a little walk around right here. So I kind of got a little bit ahead of myself. I got a little excited to start on this project. I started tearing it apart. Um, and I realized, hey, you know, all the folks at home probably want to follow along with this project. So I apologize for that. But currently where it sits is practically the way I hauled it home here back in September. And it's just been set covered since then. Um, all I've done so far really besides assessing it, putting together a game plan, we pulled off the grill, the upper grill, the lower grill, and the front bumper in preparation for pulling the engine out. But after a little bit of planning, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna hold off on that because we've got some other things that need to come first. And I'll show you why, what we've got going on inside here. Okay, here we are inside, and as you can see, we've got a lot ahead of us. Um, the original 413 big block Dodge, uh, apparently it was one of these Ranwen Park type affairs. The previous owner, who passed away and I acquired this from as an estate sale, previous owner had started to do some work on this and was about ready to get it running and didn't drain the old fuel out. And if anybody's started the vehicle that's been sitting with old varnished gas in the tank, that varnished gasoline has a tendency of gluing your valves shut. And that's exactly what happened. This guy tried to start it um, on old gas. The varnished gas glued the intake valves, or at least, at least two of the valves got glued shut. And when he cranked it, it bent the push rods. And uh, as you can see, these suckers aren't supposed to be banana shaped they're supposed to be nice and straight like that so that's why the engine sits the way it is it's been open to the elements for lord knows who how long in tucson and so what should be a nice relatively clean engine you can see it's got this kind of greasy crust that's uh it's a mixture of the fine tucson dust that blows around you got some cat hair from probably neighborhood cats that were using this as a bed. There's some, you know, rat poop and stuff. It's uh, it's pretty nasty. I, I put a battery on this, hit the key. The starter clicks. It sounds like it wants to engage real bad, but this engine is just rock solid right now. Um, so that is a project for another day. If we even are going to fool with this factory engine, which... This is kind of why I pulled off the front grill and stuff. I wanted to put a bar on the front crankshaft now to see if I could break this baby loose. Um, problem is the radiator's in the way, and in order to get the radiator out, uh, i got to pull the grill and the bumper off, of course. And if the motor is trash, the motor's going to go out through the front anyhow. So I figure it moves us along a step closer to getting something running in here. However, we're going to go a different direction with how we're going to fix this because I'm going to give you a little tour here. You'll notice this has got the 70s style shag carpet and you're, you're seeing a bucket here. Uh oh, that's not good. Uh oh, look at this dinette. Dinette is so rotted out, it is literally just falling completely apart here. So we've got the typical Winnebago sagging roof because this was a D27 Chieftain, this was top of the line for 1971. Um, and as such, it has two roof mounted air conditioners and these old school air conditioners are heavy and these old Winnebago's had flat roofs. So they were prone to having water pool in the ceiling and getting leaks and stuff anyway. And you add that, that extra weight in the roof and you can see there's quite a sag to that roof line. So as we go back on through the walls look pretty solid. The front looks pretty solid. It's just kind of dirty, but I would expect that from a vehicle that's been sitting since the 1990s. That's about right. Um, as you can see, you know, stuff like the lights, the power converter do work. I got the generator to start the other day. That's good. Um, but this shag carpet 
has been soaking up dripping water that's been coming in from the ceiling and this floor feels like I'm walking on a sponge. Uh, coming back through here, it's got a, a really good sized bathroom for an RV of this vintage. It's a wet bath. I think we're gonna convert that over to a dry bath because there's plenty of room. And uh, of course it's part storage for all the stuff the previous owner tore off the motor. But back here, this is the bad part. This is the real bad part. <clears throat> you can see this ceiling is sagging a good several inches. In fact, it's sagging so much that when you open this closet door, it actually hits the air conditioner. It sagged that much. And obviously we've got a big hole going on here with a bucket. And this is where the floor is just so spongy, it's not even funny. So this is this floor is gonna have to get totally replaced. But like any situation that's getting worse, what do you do first? Are you gonna fix this up first or are we gonna stop the damage? And that's what we're gonna do first is stop the damage. So the new game plan, we aren't going to worry about getting it running. We aren't going to worry about suspension or the fact that the brakes are obsolete and are on obtainium. We're going to start by fixing this roof because I hummed and hawed about this a whole bunch. I thought about getting a carport, one of those metal carports. Those things are fairly expensive, fairly pricey. I'm going to spend $2,500, $3,500 on a metal carport, or am I just going to go ahead and spend the couple hundred bucks thousand bucks whatever it's going to cost to fix the roof if i just fix this roof then i've eliminated all this leaking problem it's not going to get any worse once we stop the damage from getting any from from for the water from getting in so that's what we're going to do is we're going to attack this roof first and then go from there once we got the roof fixed we can just work our way down we'll patch any rot that we find in the walls and then we're going to have to work on the floor it's not my preferred method because these things were built from the ground up. The floor was built first, everything else was built on top of it, and then goes up from there. So that's the way that would be ideal to repair it, would be to take everything off, fix the floor, fix the walls, fix the roof in that order. Instead, we have to do it backwards, because if we don't fix the roof first, then any repairs to the floor are just gonna get destroyed again. So we're gonna start from the top, go to the walls, and then we'll deal with the floor. We might end up having to do a situation where literally we run two by fours across from one window to the other once the windows are removed and use some jacks on the outside and literally lift the roof and side walls off of the floor to give us a couple inches to work with to get new plywood in. But we'll have to see how that goes. That will be a video for in the far future. But anyways, a little bit of a tour here real quick. The, uh, the original driver's seat, I moved to the back here so I could get at the engine. Original passenger seat, it's got the buddy seat, double wide, pretty cool little feature. Back here, this was a rear lounge type Chieftain. Uh, it was one of the rarer models, and it, normally they would have two twin beds, a twin bed on either side. Uh, this one is a three-sided lounge, and of course I've got all the cushions. They're just put away in the closets to get them out of the road and uh, it converts into like a big queen size bed with these foam cushions. Um, obviously the Arizona sun has cooked the hell out of these side curtains. These are gonna have to get remade. A um, little bit of water damage action I can see going on here above the windows. We'll address that. I'm hoping it's just water that's been coming in from the ceiling and leaking down. There's not too much damage inside the walls. We'll have to see how that goes. But that's where we're at inside. So we've got this rear lounge. Coming forward, we've got a huge closet on the left-hand side. That's where I've got a lot of the cushions stored. It's got the original built-in central vacuum, still works. Over here on the other side, another storage closet. Plenty of room. We've got the heater down here. We've got a big fridge. Kitchen on the right. we got the stove on top. we got the gas cooktop down here sink this thing's got lots of room so let's go back outside we'll do a little walk around out there okay as i mentioned before this has got the uh, dodge 413 big block it's basically just the little brother to the 440 um it's a real torque monster not a super performer but it was plenty to get this thing down the road at 55 miles an hour and do it all day long for days on end 
Uh, previous owner replaced the tires on this. All six tires are brand new. Problem is, they were replaced about 1999 based on the date codes here. So even though these tires are brand new and still have the rubber nubs on them, they're already dry cracking. And we've got the old school style split rims. The dreaded split rims, they're not quite as dangerous as people make them out to be, at least this particular style, but you still gotta be careful because you can get hurt real bad if you don't know what you're doing messing with these. Also, it's a tube type tire, so that's one more thing that modern tire shops aren't gonna know how to deal with. So, the other thing we get to deal with on this is it's got four wheel drum brakes. When they're working great, that's fine. This thing, will, they say, will pretty much put you through the windshield when you stab the brakes with just the four wheel drums. The problem is, is that parts for them are on obtainium. They've been obsolete for 20 or 30 years, maybe even longer. So it's great when it works, but when something breaks down, you simply cannot get parts easily. Almost universally, you end up having to find someone parting one of these out to get brake parts for it. So that's not cool. Um, additionally, it's a 17 inch tube type tire. It's about 34, 35 inches tall and really skinny. So there aren't many modern tires that are available in that size. What do we do about that? Okay, well, we got brakes that are gonna be hard to source. We've got tires that are hard to source with rims, steel wheels that are difficult and dangerous to work on. Hmm, sounds to me like we should be swapping stuff, wouldn't you say? That's my thought problem is we come under the front end we're looking at this it is an old school two-wheel drive straight axle and the drag link the steering linkage on this you can see the steering box mounted there it has an old school style push pull drag link that's hooked up over here now where do you find a straight axle anymore from anything made in the last 20 or 30 years that's even remotely this width and the answer is you don't um, the rear end is a Dana 70 HD. It's got 456 gears, but again, we get this odd five lug bolt pattern. Hmm, here's the thoughts. People, several people have successfully converted these things to four wheel drive. I think that's the direction I want to go with this. Eventually, we can obtain running gear from a 4x4 dually we can swap a dually front axle in a dually rear axle do a divorce mount np205 transfer case now we've got easily sourced brakes disc brakes and if we go with like super duty axles or f550 axles they're going to be bigger disc brakes that will stop this thing better than the original drums ever could think of additionally the original braking system on this is really weird setup. It has a manual, I believe it's a manual, let's take a look, manual master cylinder up under here in the wheel well. Let's take a look. And can I even see it? I don't even know if I can see it easily from here. Here it is. Okay, so that guy right there is the master cylinder and it's manually operated. So you push on the pedal, this part right here, pushes the push rod into this manual master cylinder. Manual brakes, are you kidding? Nope, I'm not kidding, but it's manual power brakes. Get this, if you come back underneath, this is wild right here. Someplace back in the chassis, here, I gotta get a little further back to see. Can we, yeah, right there. It's a power brake booster. It's like back under the bathroom is where that is. So what happens, you step on the brake pedal, it actuates the manual master cylinder, which pushes fluid to a slave cylinder that pushes on a brake booster that then gives power boosted brake fluid to all four of the drum brakes. It's just a crazy setup and again, impossible to find parts for. So, if we go with four-wheel drive axles, we need a way to push the fluid to those calipers and drums if we, if we end up going with rear drums. I don't know if we're gonna go with rear drums or rear discs. Um, 
why don't we use a modern hydro boost up front and just power it off the power steering pump? Cool. All right. Now we got a plan. Then we delete all that extraneous bull crap that's prone to failure underneath. Well, then what do we do for drivetrain? A lot of guys, you've probably seen their YouTube channels. LS swapping these things is not a terribly hard proposition. LSs can be found in pretty much any junkyard in North America now. They're affordable. They put out adequate torque, plenty of horsepower, and they're easily turbocharged. So here's the plan. Get rid of the 413 and 727 combo with the 456 Dana 60, or excuse me, Dana 70 in the rear and the two wheel drive straight axle up front, ditch all that. In the rear, go with whatever dually axle matches a dually four x four axle in front. It'll give us a slight lift, not a lot. We don't want this thing too tall. We don't want it top heavy. MP205 transfer case to get the power to them. Go with the 6.0 liter LS motor in the front, backed up by a 4L ADE transmission. Super durable, super simple, super easy, super cheap. That'll get us a vehicle that we can buy parts for at any parts store in North America. We run the brakes with a hydro boost powered off the power steering pump. We can make the power steering pump work with the existing steering box. Or if we want to use the steering box from whatever 4x4 donor vehicle, it's a simple matter to convert from the push-pull to a uh, a crossover style steering. All we gotta do is rotate that box 90 degrees. So instead of having the Pitman arm rotating front to back, you rotate the box 90 degrees and now it swings side to side in order to work a crossover steering. So we'll be able to use all modern stuff. It'll steer good, it'll stop good, it'll have four wheel drive. So if we take this thing to the Glamis sand dunes, we get off the pavement, we're not gonna get buried up to our necks. So that's the plan there for the exterior. Um, we're gonna rebuild the roof, which probably means here, obviously next we're gonna have to, once we get measurements for the inside, we're gonna start gutting the inside of this thing. I wanna take measurements of all the existing cabinets and the bed frames and all that stuff in case we decide to rebuild it with a retro vibe. I haven't decided yet if we wanna keep the original floor plan or update to something more modern. That's, that's the question. We're going to decide that in upcoming episodes. Maybe I'll get some input from you guys. See what you think I should do. We'll just finish up our walk around here. We've got a pair of the old school 47 pound propane tanks. These things are wild. Take a look at these. It's like a barbecue tank on steroids. They're Each one is twice as big as a standard barbecue tank. Um, I think they're going to be darn near impossible to source replacements for and would probably be prohibitively expensive to get them recertified. So I think what I'm going to do, ditch these bad boys and just convert to the regular 20 pound barbecue tanks. If I have enough room and if they're available for a reasonable price, might go with a slightly larger barbecue style tank. They make them in different sizes, 30, 40 pounds, etc. But we'll see how that goes. If we do end up converting to a pair of the barbecue tanks, we can probably cut down the size of this compartment and get us a little more interior room because the top of this compartment, basically the floor runs at the level of this trim piece right here. So from here up and from the wall back is intruding into the interior compartment. Right now it's underneath that side uh, part of the lounge. But if we decided to change the rear lounge into a, like a rear master bedroom that would be in the way of like the walk around bed so something to keep in mind we might have to re-engineer this we'll see how it goes close this back up all right coming around the back it has the optional winnebago spare tire carrier and then the trunk door uh, that's where all the electrical converter the breaker box all that stuff is back in there and then coming around to the generator side, it's got the Onan 5,000 watt generator. All it needed was a fuel pump. In fact, it didn't even need a fuel pump. All it needed was the original fuel pump gone through. Again, that whole varnished gas thing. It's a, uh, it's a weird style fuel pump. The short version is that the varnished gas glued that old fuel pump solid. So I let it soak in some brake cleaner and uh, 
couple taps from the handle of a screwdriver, I was able to free up the fuel pump and thing fired right up, ran, powered both ACs, no problem. The thing was, was good to go golden. So anyway, and as you see, we got plenty of other projects going on out here, stuff for a, a later day. But anyway, here's, here's the current project. That's the game plan. Once we get the inside all measured out, we're gonna start demoing the inside. Once we get the inside demoed, then we can work on repairing that roof, stopping the progression of the damage and moving on. All right, now it's time for me to get to work. I'm gonna grab my tape measure. I got a notebook. We're gonna measure all the inside stuff so we can start the demo and all that. Remember, like and subscribe. We'll get you some fresh content here for 2022. And uh, hope you guys have enjoyed the video. Hope you learned a little something and we'll see you next time. Oh yeah, and uh, I'll leave some links in the description to the Old School Automotive Facebook page so you can follow along with pictures and ask questions directly and all that type of stuff. Thanks for tuning in.